<laughs> hey, um, I am so delighted that you all are here. Um, delighted to see you in the room. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I see some of my friends from Hong Kong. I see people that I have known for years and I see new faces. I am so excited that you're here. Um, we're going to have a conversation and we're going to touch on some things. We're, we're going to talk about um, a lot, you know, and as you all come into the room, I just want to set an atmosphere of grace and gratitude and solemn respect for the social justice things we're going to touch on. Um, I think the first thing I want to do before we even get started is just acknowledge that George Floyd's memorial, uh, the first one, occurred today. And so I just want to take a moment of silence as you all come in. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment of silence in recognition for all of the lives we've lost uh, in this quest for social justice from indigenous people, from the stolen lands you know, we stand on, to all of the ancestors, to all of the people we've lost away along the way due to social injustice. I think there's no better way to start this conversation on race than to first recognize, respect, and honor uh, all of the people that gave their lives so that we could be in this moment. So my moment of silence is gonna start now. Thank you. So you're here. I'm excited that you're here. Uh, I want to give you an overview of what you can expect. So my name is Dr. Keisha. Uh, I am the founder and person putting this together in terms of uh, Dr. Keisha Cares, but I don't operate alone. I have a great team, and I didn't talk about shouting them out, so I'll just say their first names. Hey, Riley and Jamar, uh, and everyone who supports. I'm not even going to open up that box of, you know, calling out specific names, because if I do that, then I'm really in trouble. Um, but, well, I kind of feel like I need to since I said Riley and Jamar. Ugh. I'm still not gonna do it. So my friends, I love you, forgive me. <laughs> but I'm drawing a line. So we're here in this room because we're gonna talk about race. And I want this to be an engaging conversation. So I want to let you know how you can communicate with me. So on your Instagram, be an engaging conversation. So first I'm gonna cut the volume down on mine. So, side note, if you don't know me, I usually wear glasses, but my best, one of my best friends and person I trust helped me stage everything, and his advice was clear in saying, Keisha, you can't wear glasses because people will see glare. So you're going to see two phones because there's absolutely no way I'm going to risk <laughs> going back and forth with this, and I want to make sure due to the importance of what we're discussing, that I can see your questions clearly, okay? So with that being said, uh, in the comment section, feel free to start uh, leaving your questions. I have plenty, plenty of books, uh, plenty of materials to share. And because you know I'm trained in research, I also wanna share if in the course of our time together i mention something or i share a book or i share some research and you're interested you will find links to almost everything we discussed tonight on the dr keisha cares social media pages so if it's not on instagram check our facebook go to the website dr keisha cares that's where we have everything listed as far as our social media channels and we'll have it there for you so 
feel free. And we're going to post this recording. So this will be here. So if you want to start the conversation, I'll keep an eye on the comment section. In the meantime, I am going to start us off with a story. Now we're going to talk about race and we're going to talk about race from the perspective of how do we talk about this with young children? And when I say young children, what does that even mean? Uh, what age range are we referring to? So for tonight's conversation, um, I am looking at it from the age of birth all the way until eight, nine, ten. 10. Uh, and if you have questions, feel free to ask me questions from birth to elementary, because that's the range we can comfortably work with, with the materials I have on hand. Um, with that being said, I guess I can just jump in with this story. And while I'm introducing this story, feel free to share your questions in the comments section, okay? So this story is tried and true. Um, what to do with the problem. So when we're talking about race with young children, one of the most frustrating things or one of the things a lot of parents consistently share with me is that they're constantly wondering, how do I even approach this problem? Or how do I even approach not so much race as a problem, but the larger context of how do I explain race is problematic for some parents. And in the current moment, with everything that we're seeing, race is at the height of a lot of conversations. And you're hearing terms that specifically mention reference black or African-American or Latin or Asian or any of these things. And it's not like it just started with this recent event. We had COVID-19, which showed the disparities of deaths in uh, black and Hispanic and Latino and minority, you know, uh, essential working communities, et cetera, et cetera. So some of these terms, whether we talk about race or not, children are hearing racial descriptions, right? And so this story, and I've, you know, mentioned a few, uh, sectioned off a few pages. This story, I thought, just set a great tone for how we could even begin to approach this or begin to approach race within the context of social justice. So we have what to do with a problem. And this book is written by Kobe Yamada and illustrated by Mae Benson. Notice how often we're gonna to relate to this moment in terms of what the character is describing. I don't know how it happened, but one day I had a problem. I didn't want it, I didn't ask for it, I really didn't like having a problem, but it was there. Why is it here? What does it want? What do you do with the problem, I thought. I wanted to make it go away. I shooed it, I scowled it, I tried ignoring it, but nothing worked. And this story, for us as adults, we find ourselves in the midst of several problems. And what do we do with these problems? Whether you're experiencing these problems as parents, thinking about your children, if you're experiencing these problems, thinking about social distancing, there's all these different conduits as to what actually composes the problem and then what do you do with the problem? And so I'm starting with this story just to sort of set that tone, that we are in this discussion to deal with the problem. And we may not have the vocabulary to talk about race, but I encourage you all to feel free to speak your mind in the comments section or in the questions, because I'm gonna extend a lot of grace, because I'm acknowledging that talking about race for some of us feels problematic because we may not have the vocabulary or know what to say. And in all transparency, I'm still expanding my vocabulary when it comes to how do I respectfully acknowledge my brothers or my sisters or my non-binary or my gender non-conforming friends. So we're all in this learning window. So as I ask you to participate in conversations or 
uh, share your thoughts, I want to also let you know that there's grace here. And if you encounter a problem and how you phrase your question or you may not have the right words to say or you may not know how to solve the problem of politically correct language for your question, there's grace here and it's okay. We're going to have a conversation and we're going to do it to the best of our ability. Now, are there any questions yet? I'm going to check and see. Though I think you guys are just enjoying the conversation. Are you enjoying? <laughs> it's a one-way conversation right now, but that's okay. Um, let's see. I'll check my phone. Do you have any questions or do you kind of like the style that I'm doing and you just want me to keep going through my books, which I'm very happy to do. <laughs> I think, okay, I'll keep going because we got plenty of stuff to work with. So with this book that I'm holding, What to Do with the Problem, I use this one to reference us in this moment. But let's shift now to talking about race okay now one of the things i really enjoy or how i'm going to approach uh my thoughts and feedback around the books i'm going to recommend i'm really looking at the aspect of care uh one of my mentors and a woman i really look up to uh reminded me that we should start this conversation with care and parents adults in this unprecedented moment Let's just take a second and breathe and celebrate the fact that you made it. <laughs> we have from what December when we were celebrating 2020, like who in the world saw this happening? And then from January to February, you know, everything shifted. And then in March we were sheltering in place and now it's June. <laughs> it's June. So you have had so much to deal with. And so, I think the first thing to do as we talk about psychological first aid is giving yourself the grace and the care to understand that if you didn't do everything perfect, there's no such thing as perfect because this is unprecedented times, okay? So anything that I recommend, anything that I share, take off the lens of, oh, I didn't do that or, oh, I should have done X, Y, and Z. I celebrate the fact that you're here that your family is still here, and that we're moving forward, okay? I think I saw a question. How do we calm a child who is afraid? Oh, great question. Great question. Okay, so I'm gonna share two things on that one, right? So. Psychological first aid, this is a concept by Holly Sotelo. Uh, she is the, a professor in the School of Social Work for USC. I'll link her information and all of that. But in their school, they have a method that they've come up with that they call psycho psychological first aid, right? And it basically has five concepts that it boils down to. Listen, protect, connect, and then it's a uh, model calm and then teach, right? But the very first aspect of when a child is afraid or a child is showing uh, signs of just anxiousness or nervousness, what's one of the first things that we can do? We can listen. And the perfect children's book for modeling what constructive listening is, the type of listening that falls in line with that psychological first aid is the rabbit listen. Now I'm gonna sit back so you can really appreciate this book. So it starts off with the story of a small child, right? And so automatically you have aspects of diversity and you have this space where you have a child but we don't know, you know, we can't say, oh, this child is this race, this child is that race. It's open. This child could be mixed race. That's one thing I love about this book is that the character allows the aspect of diversity to be front and center. And the idea is, is that one day they decided to build something, something new, something special. And so 
whatever made the child afraid, we can safely assume there was some incident, some experience that brought out that feeling. And so this book can sort of be the before part of the fear. And for this child, the before part, before the feelings of fear rose up, was building something. And they build this wonderful tower, you know, this wonderful wood structure. But then something happened, and it knocks it down, OK? And the thing is, this illustration can represent whatever the child tells you or identifies as the scary thing or what has them afraid. Now, in your conversations with the child, you know, I'm sure you're going to find out what are you, you know, what, what are you feeling? Um, let's talk about that. And if they haven't identified what they're afraid of, then you can just have this represent that language of all of a sudden fear starts to take hold. Because maybe we can say that the birds cause the character to be afraid. So we can still model what they're feeling, even if we don't know why they're feeling it, OK? And as you navigate your way through this story, this is that moment where we illustrate, the story illustrates that feeling of feeling fear. And the great thing about the characters in this story is that you see the animals. And parents, adults, anyone enjoying this book, have fun with the characters. I'll read this to you so you can understand what I mean. The chicken was the first to notice. Cluck, cluck, what a shame. I'm so sorry this happened. Let's talk, talk, talk about it. Cluck, cluck. But Taylor didn't feel like talking, so the chicken left. Next came the bear. I'm silly when I read, so just heads up. I'm going there. Grrr! <laughs> I told you, I'm leaning in. I'm in this moment with you. Grrr! How horrible. I bet you feel so angry. Let's shout about it. Grrr! Now, if you have a child that's feeling sad, and you decide to encompass the bear as I have leaned in and presented you with the bear, that <laughs> should get you a smile, okay? And as this story goes on, I'm not gonna read the whole story, but the various animals come forward with all of these different ways of dealing with, in this example, it's sadness, right? Of dealing with that emotion, of dealing with Taylor's uh, sadness. And Taylor, for the most part, is non-responsive or really doesn't get a chance to speak um, their feelings. And they all walk away because their suggestions aren't being implemented or their thoughts aren't being valued. And so they leave because they came into the situation just wanting to talk and jump into a solution. But the beautiful thing about this story is when the rabbit comes in. And so to go back to your question, at this moment, when a child is feeling afraid, first we acknowledge and affirm that that is their feeling. You know, we acknowledge what they're feeling, and then we create space for their feeling by sitting alongside them and say, hey, do you want to talk about what makes you feel afraid? And if you don't want to talk right now, that's OK. I just want to sit next to you and love you. I just want to sit here and be here for you. And the rabbit models that, right? And in the story, eventually, Taylor opens up and begins to tell the rabbit every single thing that happens. And then the resolution to the story is that Taylor, after speaking all of the things that were bubbling up inside, decides to rebuild and begins to dream up building something even more spectacular than what we started with. So this is a great example of how a story can build a bridge that addresses feeling afraid, but then ends with a constructive solution on how can we overcome that fear? 
what's the great thing we can build so when we feel fear again, because it's a part of life, we have tools and we have you know, mechanisms to think bigger or to realize that whatever we're afraid of, there's something within us or there's people around us that can help us build an even bigger reality, okay? I hope that answers your question. If not, feel free to let me know in the comments. Oh, yay, we have another question. How do you get beyond talking about equality or colorblindness and help kids understand the root problems of the system? Yes, great question. Oh, there's so many great ways to answer that. Okay. I think for this one, because I could take that awesome question and break it down into a whole series of books because, you know, color, equity, all of that boils down to a system, a structure. Uh, if you read How to Be Anti-Racist, you know, he goes into great detail around all the things that racism is built upon and the foundational aspect of that is policies, laws, rules. Boom! <laughs> I'm sorry, I get so excited when I talk about books because it's just, it's something I love. Um, Grace for President. Now, your question was beautiful because it says, how do we move beyond, you know, the surface level things and get down to the system? This story walks you through a class election but in the process of walking you through a class election, it explains the US democratic system. It explains how government works. And for extra kicks and giggles, you see a child of color in all her glory, who also mentions why are there no girls who have been president? And she then decides that she wants to be president. Now, using this story, as the story begins to explain government, you can begin to explain that this is how rules are made. And if you have a backstory of other books that you have read that talk about color, that talk about inequality, I have a couple I can share. You can begin to show, in fact, I can hold up one now so we can form that connection. You can begin to show how certain issues, if we go to slavery or things of the African-American experience, how it was supported by laws and rules that were made in government. And at the same time, it was dismantled or broken down by people who decided to run for office and affect change, right? And another great book that would support that, I can show you this one as well. This book actually has a picture of Abraham Lincoln in it. And so that would be another great bridge for connecting this. But the question you ask is so beautifully profound that you could begin to take it apart bit by bit with several books that you read over the course of a series that begin to really explore these issues. But this is where you probably want to start if you're very interested in talking to a child about systems. And the wonderful thing about Grace is that you watch the whole classroom get involved in the class election for president. And of course, you can't have an election without an opponent. And the students decide that they're going to represent states. So this book literally explains to a child how our elections work. And since it is an election year, November is right around the corner. I'm sorry, I'm just thinking that it's June now. <laughs> and I've been inside and now I'm saying November is right around the corner. Like where did the year go? But <laughs> Coming back to you, you can actually see through the descriptions of how important it is to vote and then what each state represents because it also talks about the bigger aspects of voting. So I think 
this book is an outstanding example because it talks about the delegates and what uh how many states have how many delegates and they also have to give their stump speech and that idea of you know election night when we're counting the ballots so this is just a great book to delve into to address that so that is grace for president uh let me see if there's any other outstanding questions i'm so happy to see you guys in here awesome so if you're enjoying the conversation or if things are, you know, heading in the direction you're happy with, let me know in the comments. If you want to hear more about certain books, that's fine too. Uh, and if you have questions, feel free to keep throwing them at me. I love that because like I said, I have a massive box of resources, but I don't know what to share until I hear from you. But I absolutely prepared several things in the meantime. So I want to go deeper into how we talk about race. And I also want to delve into how we can talk about race in the context of what we're seeing right now in this moment. Um, on the picture that advertised this live, I had a picture of a child of color holding up a sign that uh, shows, you know, George Floyd uh, that wrote, you know, had his name listed. And the power of that is just amazing because how do you even begin to discuss um, what happened to a child in young age, you know, at such a young age. And I think the undefeated does one of the best jobs I've seen of that. And it's a poem that has these beautiful illustrations that just explains. And the undefeated is by Kwame Alexander and illustrated by Kadir Nelson. I have a few of uh, his books and the illustrators work as well. But the undefeated basically celebrates the resilience of the african-american race and it starts off by this is for the unforgettable the swift and sweet ones who hurdled history and opened a world of possible and as the story continues to unfold you walk through the history of african-americans in america and the author talks about the ones who survived America by any means necessary. And so this story in very forthright but achievable language talks about the African American experience and it does it in a way that is honest but it's also honorable. And it has historical picture, pic um, pictures of African Americans, like this page, you see amazing, you have Zora Neale Hurston, we have Langston Hughes, we have, I believe this is the Bois, and we have other various painters. Now here's the thing, okay? There is a cheat sheet in the back. <laughs> Please don't feel like you need to know who each and every person in this book is. There is a nice glossary that explains who the person is and what they've contributed, okay? But one of the most powerful images I wanna fast forward to, it talks about the protest, okay? And it starts with the civil rights movement because we're familiar with that, but it's done in such a way that this image could apply to right now, okay? except you don't see face masks. That's about the only difference. But another important thing about this book, which is why I suggested it, is it also talks about the violence that has occurred in the pursuit of social justice. And it brings us all the way up to what we're dealing with right now. And you see in this image, Mike Brown, we see uh, Trayvon Martin, we see Tamir Rice, and we have a memorial and where George Floyd um, was tragically taken from us, there is a memorial that looks just like that in that spot. So that's another way to bridge what's in the story with what's happening in real life, okay? So I just wanted to share 
this story as well because it also talks about nonviolence and the peaceful protests that we're starting to really see rise up right now and be the dominating narrative in the news creates a great segue to talk about Martin Luther King and the whole movement of nonviolence and the student protests and all of those things. So these are other interesting ways to approach race, but doing it in a way that is age appropriate. Okay, I see some questions, which is awesome. It means we're heading in the right direction. Oh yeah, we got a couple of questions. Eclectic Grits and TV Shiz 2018, thank you for the question. I want to give out roses because this is a dialogue and I thank you, Cusick. Oh, you know you have a special place in my heart. Thank you for asking the first question. Uh, delighted to see the individuals in the room. Um, off to, oh, okay, thank you. What would you recommend teachers do before engaging these texts with their students? Oh, great question. Um, let's see, Eclectic Grits, what work, oh, what work would you recommend? Sorry, white on white. It's a great outfit, but I was not thinking about <laughs> what that would mean when trying to read these questions. What work would you recommend teachers do before engaging these texts with their students? Okay. So let's look at the books I've shared so far, right? Um, if we're looking at race, then some of the work um, teachers could do could start off by asking children to discuss certain topics like I, I'm trying to think well first let me this this is where my mind is because I'm thinking about what age range right uh, for the teacher is for this classroom so uh, eclectic could you comment on what age range or what type of teacher are we th talking about a pre-k are we talking about like a third grade teacher because that really sets the tone for the type of questions or how we would even begin uh, the conversation or even setting the tone for the book. But while I wait on you to answer, I'm just gonna speak to it in general, okay? But I can get far more specific once you uh, give me some details on maybe what age range uh, the teacher might be teaching to, okay? But for now, I'm just going to keep it specific or uh, loose. Uh, say it's a, a home environment, or it's a, an after-school program and you have mixed rate, uh, mixed range of ages. So if I'm talking about race, I would say something, you know, I'm pretty forthright. Um, have any of you seen, you know, the protest on the news or have you seen uh, people walking down the street with signs and things of that nature? Like I would engage the children in talking about the current events. And I wouldn't do it in a way that's leading. I would just do it in a way that's natural. And I would keep my tone open and neutral. And I would just ask them, like we started off with the rabbit, listen. I would ask them what it is they're seeing. And you know kids in a classroom, because I've been a classroom teacher, you're going to have a few kids that just jump out, you know, and you're going to hear what the conversation is in the home. Okay, some child may say George Floyd, uh, some child may say, you know, people are protesting, you know, all of these things may come up. And so, and they may not even use the word protesting, depending on what grade we're dealing with, but they may say, you know, a lot of people are outside or they may have participated in a protest because we see pictures of families bringing their children out to these protests because they may believe that this is an, an important moment and they want the child there. So I would first open up the dialogue by finding out where are the children in their experiences and then guiding that collectively into a discussion. If it was this book, I would say, well, if we're going to talk about George Floyd, he was absolutely uh, someone who experienced social injustice. And this story is one of the ways we can begin to talk about and learn about how other uh, individuals of the African-American race have not only dealt with 
social injustice, but how they have risen from it. And one thing I read, and I'm happy to share this, I thought it was so fascinating that when talk, um, so one article that I read, they were talking about how when dealing with a difficult issue, like this book talks about slavery, we talk about people who were killed by police, one of the things they mention is when we're talking about this with young children, particularly younger children, we don't want the sole focus on the conversation to be on the negative thing or the difficult thing that happened. Like in this book, we see slavery and we see four little girls. And we're not going to shy away from the truth of what happened, but we're also going to make sure we include what this inspired. So we're going to look at who hurt, but we're also going to look at who helped. And when we talk about what this inspired, right now you see the protest, you see people uh, protesting. I'm on this live because I was inspired by what I saw. So when we experience a negative thing, and this is what I would explain to the children, that we're going to read a story that talks about how we deal with difficult things, but then we're gonna think about how we can be inspired to be a part of the change that makes sure those difficult things don't happen again, or that we grow up and be the kind of individuals that run for office so we can create the policies or the rules that make sure that these sort of things never happen again, or that we develop the listening skills so that we can understand what people are feeling so we can be better friends, better classmates, and I could just keep going with this, but I hope that gave you a sense of where you can go with that. And if you have shared you know, more detailed information, I'll definitely look into that. I saw some more questions, but I'm gonna uh, keep going. Let's see. Oh, elementary teachers, awesome. Yeah, okay, I think we did that. But if I you know, <laughs> need to say more, let me know. This is so much fun. I'm so glad you guys are here. Uh, let's see. I see another question. Okay, okay. Katie, Katie P, let's see. So I have been noticing people on social media talking about a kid's book about rape. Oh, yes! Uh, racism about Jelani memory. What is your opinion? Okay. I actually... Um, I listened to, uh, I went to order it because I wanted it to be a part of my um, collection. And, you know, it's out of stock because in these <laughs> tumultuous times, everybody's rushing <laughs> to Amazon and buying all the books that specifically talk about racism. When in reality, we could talk about race <laughs> and racism in several ways. But I love that you asked this question, Katie, because you really give me a chance to dig into some things. So for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Jelani Memory wrote a children's book about racism, but he did it in a way that is not intimidating and it's age appropriate. Um, he uses font and color to really talk about skin color and what it feels like to experience racism and explains in kid-friendly ways what racism means, what racism impacts, and how you can be uh, someone who doesn't exhibit this behavior. And so on YouTube, you can listen to the entire book and it's written and read by Jelani Memory on uh, the YouTube channel. But I would say this about um, the book. It's not a book to read alone. And even in the first few pages of the actual book, the author himself uh, lets parents know, this is a book to start a conversation, okay? And because you're here with me, I am so glad you asked that question because I wanna share with you a great way to illustrate that point or illustrate the point that the book conveys. So if, and you can do this before you read the book or after you read the book, but my personal consensus, 
it's a great book. If you can't get a hold of the book, use the YouTube video and listen to the story and then use the suggestion I'm going to share with you about how to unpack, you know, the weight of a topic such as racism. So this is a real simple thing you can do. And I'm going to use one of my favorite books on diversity. So you'll need two books, right? And <laughs> unfortunately, I am woke AF and I don't have a sample book to really show you uh, the model, but you won't have a hard time finding this. So go to a used bookstore, okay? Go to a Salvation Army, a thrift store, a thrift shop, or even get on Amazon. Uh, you want to find a book that only shows one race within the book. And unfortunately, when it comes to children's literacy, we are just now experiencing a deep integration and a massive moment of like um, there's an organization called We Need Diverse Books. There are plenty of organizations that have started in the last 10 years, 15 years. I don't think any of them are uh, 20 years old, but it's very recent that you started to see pushback and saying we want to see more books where different experiences are represented. So you can easily go in and find, and when I say a book where you only see uh, one color, I'm just being diplomatic, basically a book where the characters are all white. And if you can find, if, <laughs> I laugh at that because it's not that hard to do, but uh, you want to find a book where you have more than just one character, more than just one family, okay? And that's nothing to take away from the author. The story could be great, but you still get to see that it's a one-sided lens of society. So find that book. Find that children's book where all the characters are white, all right? Then take one of your more diverse books where you have diversity, inclusion, in all sorts of ways. If you have read Jelani Memory's book or listened to his book about racism, then on the next night, you know, read one of the other stories, okay? I don't know what the rhythm is with your, if it's a classroom or a parent, child, read aloud, but read the series of stories. That's one way. And then have conversations on what is the difference between the books where all the characters look a certain way and the other book where you start to see diversity. And then explain to your child to further anchor in this whole message of racism in an age appropriate way that we want to live a life where we hear the stories of all children, where all stories are welcome. And we're not looking at the experience of only one culture or one race. And when you find yourself in situations where you're only hearing about one race one story, one view, be careful. Because that is a landscape where we have to think about the bigger things that can begin to show up. And so I think that's one of my favorite ways of really talking about racism in an age appropriate way. But it doesn't necessarily limit us because in our diversity, like I wanna make sure that I'm clear on this part. When you're talking about that book where there's only one race, I want you to make sure to point out places, particularly when you have a book where they have done such a spec. I mean, look at the cover, guys. What? <laughs> what? Look at that. When you have such an outstanding display of diversity, I want you to go through the monochromatic book where it's only one and invite the child to think about where we could insert diversity. You know, if they're at a park, where could we see more diversity? Or where could we think of adding our friends? And is it, you know, what other things could we be doing? And this book is perfect because it models all of that. You have not only color diversity, you have religion, you have all, you have uh, people from different parts of the world. Like you have so many great examples of diversity within that space. And so when you do it in that way, where you have your book that shows one story, and if you want to go into a research mindset, or if you just want something for yourself, think about uh, 
Chamande Adiche. Uh, I may be butchering her name, so Queen, if you ever see this, I apologize. But she has a TEDx talk or a TED talk that talks about the, the, tr the danger of a single story, okay? And so the single story that we see when it's only one perspective, if it's just, you know, I can't really hide it from you, but if we just focus on one child's experience and we block out everyone else's, we miss the beauty of a fuller story. So I hope that gave you like some good tips on how you can not only use Jelani Memory's book, but then you could build on what that book touches on in terms of racism and expand it into a very um, realistic and tangible way of understanding what racism stops you from experiencing from a child's perspective. It stops you from experiencing so many new friends and it only limits you to one group of friends. But when you open yourself up to diverse experiences, you allow yourself to be friends with so many new people. And that's another great way of talking about racism. Okay, Katie P, I hope that was helpful. Great question. Let's see, oh, the questions are coming in. What kinds, of, what kinds of projects that young children, elementary school, thank you for that, elementary school could do to engage them on conversations about race and social justice? Yes, what kinds of projects? Okay, now this is something I will definitely follow up with more information on the Dr. Keisha Care social media uh, pages because I wanna give you actual links uh, to, you know, implement these suggestions. So if we're talking about conversations about race and social justice, actual projects, I love engaging in certain works such as if you want to start with artwork, if you want to start with letters, um, having the children write these uh, letters or creating this artwork and then sending it to an organization like the ACLU and thanking those civil rights attorneys or those people on the front lines for the work that they're doing. That empowers the child because, perfect example, <laughs> real life example, my nephew drew this picture for me uh, about three weeks ago. And it says, you are a superstar and for bragging rights i just want to point out that this is everybody in the family and this is me do you see how big my star is thank you nephew but on the back of this little note he wrote you are the only one that is a pro at making things funny and doing things that are fun you are a genius at stuff he will never know how every, and I put this little picture on my refrigerator. When I was thinking about doing this IG Live, when I was thinking about growing Dr. Keisha Cares or starting Dr. Keisha Cares, it was his little message that I was a superstar that gave me so much encouragement. So when you talk about how do we engage children, elementary, in projects and activities that marry race and social justice, and then turn it into a tangible encouragement, I highly recommend having them do artwork, having them send letters to organizations that are on the front lines of social justice work, words of encouragement, because you never can underestimate the power of a note. It was his note because I was a little, you know, I was a little nervous about getting online in front of you all. Like I, I'm not really, you know, too savvy with these things and, I didn't know what would happen, but just seeing this word of encouragement. So that's just one way, but you can also really open it up. You can do fundraisers. You can do things that raise actual capital and then donate that to an organization. There are a wealth of wonderful things you can do. You can do a book drive. You can do sorts of activities where you collect art materials and you send them to schools that may have lower um, lower income or lower socioeconomic status because as we deal with whatever school is going to look like in the fall 
I can guarantee that some budget cuts will have occurred and some things that students may have been used to in 2019 may not be available in 2020. So you can think in so many different levels. Uh, thank you for that question. That is a beautiful way to move from uh, listening to implementation to action, you know? All right, let's see. <laughs> Are there any more questions? I plan to, you know, stick with you all till nine. Uh, so we actually have 10 more minutes. I'd love to hear from you all in the comments. Did you find this helpful? Um, I, I was so nervous. <laughs> I was nervous and excited uh, about this moment, but I wanted to do this. Uh, with all my credentials, with everything I bring to the table, I realized that there is a space to just support and I wanted to support adults, parents, everyone who is just dealing with this moment. And Dr. Keisha Cares, the website, the events, we are rolling out like we do. It, the whole concept just launched last Saturday, if you can believe that. Wow, yeah, last Saturday. And in the midst of all of this, um, it just sort of gave us an opportunity to jump wide in. So I'd love to hear from you. If you have questions, if there are additional things that you'd wanna hear, um, we have some really cool stuff coming. Uh, something called Stories of Parents, where we have, you know, I'm a narrative uh, researcher by trade, and I have amazing stories from parents that I'm gonna share uh, with other parents because as awesome as parenting can be, this, Sugar, honey, iced tea is not easy, <laughs> particularly in these unprecedented times. Parenting never came with a manual, but it absolutely never came with a manual that explained how to parent in the midst of a pandemic or in the midst of the leadership that we have uh, at the national level or with the global uncertainty of, our, uh, of the economies so many things are happening and parenting in this moment no nobody's seen this before so any and all support that we can extend particularly in those crucial years of early childhood elementary all of those developmental milestones that's why dr keisha cares was created and i have a great team of people uh that you know support the work and are a part of the work so i'm just delighted that i was able to spend this time with you all i'm gonna stop showing my gratitude and my love and look at your questions and your comments right <laughs> all right let's see jelani every okay Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm really glad to hear that. Um, electric grits or e eclectic grits. I'm sorry for calling electric grits. <laughs> you are eclectic grits and I'm glad you're here. Um, oh, I'm glad you like. Yes. Um, you asked if we will save this live uh, and share it on Instagram. Yes, we absolutely will. Uh, my social media guru uh, is on this feed and it is absolutely going to be made available uh, for you all. And we may even do a uh, future lives because with this sheltering in place, I got a closet full of great outfits and not a lot of opportunities <laughs> to wear them. And so like I actually put on shoes. I didn't know if you'd be able to see my feet <laughs> just in case. And I think this is the first time I've worn nice shoes in like four months. So, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I am living my best life with you all. Oh, there's some new questions. Okay, let's see. Many students do not have parents that stand up for injustice or racism. So we must stop that cycle in the classroom. I will be adding these books to my Amazon wish list. Thank you. Oh, my honor. 
Um, in that case, let me see. I have plenty of books and I really just picked books that answered your questions. But with the time we have left, let me just share some other great books to support any and everyone's work in talking about race or talking about social justice issues with young children. Let's see. There's a few I haven't touched on. Simone visits the museum. Sorry, my, my lighting, there we go. That's the angle where you don't see all the glare. <laughs> Simone visits the museum. Now this is a book that's independently published, but you can find it on Amazon. And in the rush to buy a lot of diverse books, you should still be able to get this wonderful jewel because it's under the radar. But I support big publishing companies and I support independent authors because everybody has a story to tell. But the reason why I recommend this book is because it centers on a family of color and it's an African-American family. And they, the mother and daughter have a girl's day and they visit the African-American History Museum, the Smithsonian. And so this image right here can open up a whole dialogue about African-American history, okay? And that's just one. And I also wanna point out, because when we talk about race, it's not only in the lens of African-Americans. We have a beautifully diverse world. And so one of the reasons why I didn't really go into all of the great features about this book, but this book talks about the United States and it looks at the flag, the red, white, and blue, but it talks about diversity. And it talks about all of the things that make America great. Pick up what I just put down. <laughs> Here is another one. And um, this book is a wordless picture book. I invite you to use this book for several reasons. First of all, give the child an opportunity to tell a story. And whether your child is reading or not, this book takes all of that pressure off by telling a story without using words. And you can invite a child to narrate the story. And the beautiful thing is you have three friends. And I'm going to find a picture where you start to see them in more detail. But the friends are diverse. Okay? And let me see, I may move this up so you can see it a little better. But you have this beautifully illustrated story with friends who represent diversity. And I see my little timer is uh, showing up and letting me know I have less than a minute 50 uh, remaining. And I will probably, because I'm just generous with the knowledge, I'm going to leave you with this great gem. Uh, the day you begin because this book talks about diversity and race, but it also talks about socioeconomic difference. And it, we have a family that's on the lower spectrum. And it also talks about a child who immigrated into the States from Venezuela. So we can also begin to talk about immigration and the social justice issues that are there. Because as we begin to expand the dialogue, we talked about race today, but we know social justice is a complicated thing. And so I love not only the author, Jacqueline Woodson, who's written beautiful work. Um, we can begin to introduce other social justice issues. So as we're creating these future thinkers who may be revolutionaries, who may be change agents, we can get them to realize that social justice has so many different things to dismantle. Social inequality, financial inequality, come back to Martin Luther King and the Poor People's Campaign, immigration. We've seen so much in the past three years around immigration, and we still have people dealing with separation from families and detainees. So I invite you to dig into these books, stay in touch with Dr. Keisha Cares. This is such a great experience. Thank you for spending this time with me. It has been a joy and a pleasure. Stay tuned. I'm pretty sure we'll do this again because it was such a fun experience. And enjoy your life. Take care of your mental health.
拜。